with the needle. The general struggle was to make a union shop and to make union hours. Now we worked, when I came up to the shop, we worked Saturdays and we worked uh, uh, nine hours a day. We uh, worked very hard, you know, it wasn't as freedom as uh, it is later on. But the anarchists didn't like their behavior, their action in the union. They wanted more freedom in the union. They wanted that they uh, should elect people from the shops. And uh, naturally it was as usual, I don't know whether you're acquainted with unions, but there's a machine and they elect whomever is, uh, that they feel like. We happened to get in because we were very active and the workers voted for us. I think they made a constructive contribution to the to the union, especially in the beginning, where it was a, a question of a good deal of uh, self-sacrifice. I think they, uh, many of the, uh, the radicals, you know, were in those days were ready to sacrifice their time, their energy, their health for the activists in the union, to go out and pick it at any time during the day or night was a, was a duty and a responsibility that was readily accepted and carried out. There was no problem of getting people when it came especially to the anarchists, the socialists and the radicals, you know, to, to go. They showed an example to all the others and were the first ones on the line. doing? What were some of your activities in the, within the movement? Well, what shall I say? I started off as a kid, young fella, got into Syracuse, New York, and a strike broke out. Spontaneously, Little Falls, New York. And I tell you, comrades, they asked me to go down there and lead the strike. I led the strike down there for several weeks. Surrounded many times by gunmen at night in the halls. That time pickets didn't have liberties like they had today. 
And I conducted that strike until Bill Haywood came down from Paris and took over. There I left Chicago. Just prior to that, I'd been involved in a strike of Rochester, New York, the, the clothing colors. I lost my job. That's why I had to go to Utica. Then Utica involved in the Little Falls strike, so I had to leave there. So I came to Chicago. And I tried to get a job in Chicago and couldn't get a job because the association had to be blacklisted. So I went down to St. Louis and tried to get a job, couldn't get that job. Well, then I got back to Chicago. I got active then in, in the Amalgamated Union and worked as a clothing cutter. And then during the 1915 strike, I was arrested 39 times. Because, you know, the policeman watches you, and if you hit him with your hands, then he arrests you. So he shouldn't be arrested, so I used to, with my knee. <laughs> the, the policeman said once to the judge, you know, I was arrested, and it came to the trial. So the uh, judge asked him, what did you do? He says, Your Honor, she hit me. So he gives a look, and I was standing in the pit. So he says, she hates you. She's so small. He says, Your Honor, she jumped up. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, I slept. <laughs> so naturally, you know, those things happen very often. Because when you go and take down a shop, you get in a fight. But you don't want the policeman to see you because he's arresting you. So you try to do it your way, the way you can. How many times are you arrested? Oh, plenty. But I used to go out from the, you know, the lawyer would bill, bill me out, and I would go back to the big line. I never seen, you know. I always would go back because I did things there that arrest you because you start a fight with them. But the way I fought them, they couldn't see it. So they arrest me because I was in the cloud to fight. Well, uh, but they didn't see me actually doing it. So you were an agitator. <laughs> well, we all try to do our best.
it was team teaming at that side at that time there were all kinds of uh, activities there were there were the literary cafes where writers Jewish writers used to get together there was the theatrical cafe that was the cafe Royale on 12th Street and second Avenue you know where the theatrical people used to get together then there was the cafe where rank and file used to go to like uh, the cafe on on second avenue and uh, st mark's place there was a waiter by the name of charlie he was the the nerve center for all the the uh, communications communication nerve center for all the the messages and uh, whatever we needed see we leave word with charlie and uh, spend hours, have a cup of coffee there and spend hours, you know, kibitzing and uh, discussing and trying to solve the problems of the world. See. If we take the trouble to look at what we call the lexicon of Yiddish literature, which is a, an eight or nine volume work, we'll notice that most, the most famous Yiddish writers will have a notation that they started their debuts were in on the pages of the Frey Avdishtam. And this was not just a, a coincidence, it was a pattern. It happened. Every budding writer, poet, dramatist, short storyteller knew that if he has any, if he shows any signs of talent, it will be recognized by the then editor Saul Janowski, who had an uncanny feeling to recognize who has in him something and who is just a, uh, a, a dilettante. And he would have in each issue of the Frey Arbeiterstimme a special column where he would answer and he would tell the guys, you better go back to shoemaking or you, back a, you, you become a street, you, your talent shows that you're going to be a good street cleaner something like this. But on the other hand, if he discovers something, he printed it, and he encouraged the fellow. Geiser, geiser, stiller Drimmel, bist kein Heilung für mein Schmerz, bist kein End für euch das Rufen, euch das Suchen von mein Herz. In der Schönheit such ich Sturm, in dem Sturm such ich Ruhe, euch dem Busen von dem Sturm Mach ich meine Augen zu. Giving out leaflets, that's all we knew. There was a man by the name Marcus. I don't know if you heard of him. He was the craziest vegetarian. He only lived on nuts and raisins. That's it. And he was wearing rubber shoes. And he was the craziest anarchist we ever had. He was the one that used to write. But the whole work was, for us, was given that literature. We were going to lectures, there was an awful lot of doings at that time. Labor Temple, 40th Street, was a very busy place. And McGoldman used to lecture there, Boitman used to be there, and whoever was in, uh, Durant, uh, Will, William Durant he used to lecture there, everybody used to lecture there. That was a, a beautiful place, we used Friday night, how we got to to the lecture. It was never, never a Friday night that we didn't go to hear a lecture. Saturday night we had a dance. But that was when we were in your age. At this point, we don't need a dance. <laughs> I mean, life wasn't all dull for these anarchists. It wasn't all the sweatshop, although many hours of their, their day were spent working. They had their evenings. The amazing thing is they had enough energy in the evening to attend lectures. And for the one day that they were free from their, their jobs, they would go on an anarchist picnic, or they would go to an anarchist dance. The sorts of dance they had were the, the Beurenbau. Beurenbau means the peasant dance, where they would all dress up as peasants and apples would hang from the ceiling and they'd try to bite into them and they would hold raffles to raise money for the cause. The Arrestanten.